chapter 6, verse 12, where we're told to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So we're told that this, this living for Christ is a fight. All right? Paul uh, compares it to wrestling. He compares it to a fight. He compares it to warfare. <clears throat> and we're told that if we're going to fight this fight, we might as well fight a good one. Now, I, I don't like to fight, but if I have to get into one, I want it to be a good one. Well, what's a good one? The one you win. Hey, man, if, if you lose it, you know, if, some, if, I, if I lose a fight and somebody says, hey, you fought good, well, no, not good enough, buddy, I lost, okay? So if I have to fight, I want to win one. I was looking uh, recently, I, I was wanting to buy an AR-15. And uh, so I was looking around, and I went to a gun shop, and the guy said, what you looking for? And oh, I'm sorry, we're in eastern North Carolina. He said, what you looking? And I said, uh, I'm looking for an AR-15. I'm kind of shopping for one. He said, well, look, you can build them many different ways for different reasons. What do you want it for? And I said, well, look, hopefully it never happens. But if everything crumbles down and there's roving gangs trying to take your stuff, he said, you want to compete? And I said, no, sir, I don't want to compete. I want to win. Uh, who wants to compete? I just want to win. He said, then here's the one you need. <laughs> uh, so if you're going to fight, you might as well fight good. Now, if I'm going to serve the Lord and fight this spiritual battle, I, I want to come out on top. And by the way, we're going to come out on top, right? But I, I want to, while I'm here on earth, on this side of the victory, I want to be fighting a good fight for the Lord. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, did you turn there? Is that where I told you to turn? I just said, Matthew, the whole book is good. So we'll turn to Matthew chapter 6. My wife, hey y'all, my wife is getting old. She had to get glasses. Isn't that something? I'm, I'm still young. The, just kidding. That's on my face. These don't count. <laughs> Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth look corrupt where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also Solomon tells us in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 keep thine heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life so we see first in first timothy paul's telling timothy look this life of faith is a fight it's a battle fight it well fight a good fight we see jesus saying and and we learned last week this battle is for our heart and he said what you need to do is don't lay up for yourselves treasure upon earth. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven because wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be also. You know, I'm sure if, uh, if let's say, the Ivy's house, God forbid this would ever happen, but the, they come home one day and there's smoke coming out the eaves of that house and, I mean, you can tell it's on fire and, and, and Brad says, man... There are some things I need to run in there and get. His family's not in there. That's no question. But there's some things. I've got to run in there and try to get some things. I, I doubt seriously that Brad would run in and grab the cookbooks. I, I doubt that he would go in and say, where's the sewing machine? I, I doubt he would go in and say, I need to save the vacuum cleaner. I'm sure there's some things in that house that if Brad could get to, he would almost risk his health to get to those things. Rachel would say, grab our wedding photos. He would say, I will after I get my flounder gigging gear or after I get my hunting guns or after I get whatever. Why? Because that's where his heart is now if the wife and the kids were in there he would get them after he got the guns of course and, and 
No, if, if his family was in there, of course, he would even sacrifice those things with the tear in his eye to get his family out of there. Why? Because that's where his heart is. Now, this warfare that we face, that the battleground is the heart. And then Solomon tells us in Proverbs, he says, now, keep your heart. Protect your heart is what he's saying. Put a defense around it. Put a barrier around it because there is a battle for that heart. And then he goes on to say, for out of it are, uh, uh, out of it are the issues of life. Now, we're going, are the slides ready? Okay, I'm going to try to do this. The first ones we're going to go through, just review right quick, okay? Hey, I did, okay, remember there's two types of value we assign to things. There's intrinsic value and there's assigned value. Remember, Brother Head gave... Brother Head, did I give you that $20 back last week? Did I not? Did I really not give it back to you? No, I didn't. Did I owe you 20 bucks? Did I give it? Dana, did you get that $20? Hey, hold, hold on a minute, y'all. Let's see here what we got. No, I'm <laughs> Did I give it back to you? I left it back here. Oh, phew. Man, because that night, okay, time out, y'all. I just need to have a conversation with him. That night, I got to thinking, man, I don't remember giving him that $20, and I don't have it. And so, But you did get it back. Whew. Okay. Why is that $20 bill worth $20? It's not because it's $20 worth of paper. It's not because it's $20 worth of ink. It's because our government said this piece of paper is worth 2,000 pennies. Now, whatever value is placed upon that paper... Now, how many of those you offer me will determine some things in my life or cause me to determine some, It's going to. How many of those you offer me an hour or a day will determine whether or not I want to work for you? How many of those you offer me an hour or a day or whatever will determine what size house I live in, what kind of uh, food I eat, how I'm clothed, my, my health insurance and things like that? Why? Because there's a value that's been assigned to it. Now, there's an intrinsic value, which means it is actually worth that much. Now, that $20 bill is no longer backed by gold. Our money used to be backed by a gold standard, and it's not anymore. It's just, hey, uh, it's worth $20, whatever that means. Then there's the assigned value. We do, do this all the time. We, we assign value to things all the time. I, I told my son Carson one day on the way to school, I love you. And he said, I love you more. And I said, I don't know that you can love me more. You may love me as much, but you can't love me more. I love you more than life. And the Bible said there's no greater love than that. I said, I would give my life. If somebody was going to shoot you, I'd jump in front and take the bullet and not even have to think about it. Do you love me that much? And he said, I'm going to have to think on that. <laughs> okay? I have assigned to him a value greater than that of my own life. There are some things I have. I have this little box of old coins. They're probably not worth a whole lot of money. But to me, they're worth a whole lot. I've assigned a lot of value to them. Why? Because me and my Paul collected those together. And so I see those coins. It reminds me of my Paul Paul. I have an old fireman's uh, hat, like a dress hat. And that hat probably not worth any money, but to me it's worth a lot because my papa retired from the fire department when he was a young man, and, and that was his hat. So there's a, a lot of value I've assigned to that. Let's see, what was the next slide here? Okay, here, here's some of the things. It's hard, here's two conclusions. It's hard to keep what God says is important, important to our heart, okay, in our heart. And you will either be propelled by, or here's the next. You will, your life will either be propelled by or victimized by what you treasure. What you treasure is going to motivate you to do what you do. <clears throat> if I treasure the same thing as God treasures, then man, spiritually, I'm going to begin to grow. I'm going to be fruitful. But if I treasure something other than what God treasures, now I'm going to stand in the way of God's plan and design for my life. Let's look at the next thing here. There's five possible ways that treasure... Uh, your treasure can shift. And we'll go through these rather quickly. We said, and by the way, these are not, when I'm talking treasures here, we're not going to be talking about material things. I think that's obvious, okay? Um, but we're going to be talking more of a thing of the heart, an inward thing, identity. That identity is moving from identity in Christ to identity in what I do. Look, you know what I am. Well, you're a pastor. 
Uh, yeah, but that's not really what I mean. Well, you're a dad. Yeah, but that's not really what I mean. Well, you're, you're a husband. You're a, a little league football coach. You're, you're whatever. Yeah, but that's not really what I mean. Here's what I am. First and foremost, I'm a child of God. My identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Now, if I'm not careful, as I, even in trying to serve God, my, my treasure will shift from moving from identity in Christ to identity in what I do. For instance, well, uh, what are you? Well, I'm a Sunday school teacher. Years ago, Brother Rouse was out knocking on doors, and somebody answered, and, and he asked him, look, if you died right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And the man said this, uh, look, I'm, a, I'm the treasurer at such and such church. So Brother Rouse said, man, that's great. But if you died right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And he said, man, I just told you I'm a treasurer at such and such church. And Brother Rouse so tactfully said, so Judas was a treasurer too. And the guy said, there's the road, <laughs> and shut the door. What His identity at that point was not wrapped up in Christ. It was wrapped up in what he does. Here's the next thing. Oh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. His identity was wrapped up in God. The next thing was maturity. That's defining spiritual well-being, not by the mirror of the word, but by what I do. <clears throat> you know what's to measure us as, to, uh, as our spiritual well-being and our spiritual growth? The word of God. This is what we measure ourselves against. This is a mirror to us. And as we read it and as we study it and as we dive into it, it ought to show us a couple things. It ought to show us the glory of a holy, holy, holy God. And then it ought to show us our own sinfulness in comparison to that. And this book is a mirror to show us where we are spiritually. But if I'm not careful, I will let my spiritual maturity be wrapped up not by what the word or, or be defined not by what the word of God says but by what I do now at that point my treasure is not in heavenly things <clears throat> for instance I look in the word of God and I say oh my I'm not like Christ but I want to be like Christ I begin to yield to him the Holy Spirit works in my heart and life I've yielded to him but when my treasure becomes me I say well I know I'm a Christian because I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this. Now no longer are we measuring ourselves by the Word of God. We're measuring ourselves by what we do against what others do. And now at that point, our treasure is not in heavenly things. Our treasure is, is in earthly things. Let's see. I think I, uh, Paul said, Thou speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have not charity. I'm become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Paul said, and those first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13 says, though I give my body to be burned, and though I give all everything I have to the poor, and then he keeps on saying, if I don't have charity, I'm nothing. Because our spiritual well-being is not met, uh, uh, wrapped up or measured by what we do. What we do ought to come from our spiritual well-being. Our spiritual well-being is measured by the Word of God. Here's the next thing, our reputation. <clears throat> this shift in treasure here, and I'll be wrap, wrapping up here, uh, uh, the, the re intro or the review. Reputation, a shift, shifting from a life shaped by the zeal for the reputation of Christ to a life shaped by hunger for the praise of people. You follow that? when we're getting ready to do something or we're making a decision, is our thought, well, how will this reflect Christ to a world? Or is our thoughts, what will they think of me? You, you see the difference there? <clears throat> so our reputation, what, what I do should be motivated by the glory of Christ. John the Baptist said it best when his disciples came to him and they said, hey, look, that Jesus, everybody, they've been coming to you. You've had large crowds. They've been coming to you and being baptized. Now they're going to Jesus. And John said it best. He said, well, he must increase. I must decrease. John was saying, you know, it's not about my reputation. 
it, it, my motivation, my zeal for the Christian life shouldn't be about what do people think of me. Rather, it ought to be what do people think of Christ. And the moment that I, I get this idea in my head, well, it matters what people think of me. Now my treasure is not in heavenly things. Now my treasure is in earthly things. Now we, now we can move on here to the next. Essentiality. This is moving from rest in the essential presence of Jesus to seeing myself as way too essential to what God is doing. Okay? <clears throat> Instead of seeing myself as one of many of God's tools, I begin to see myself as the answer to the problem. Listen, sir, in your home, you, you know you're not the answer to the problem. Only Christ is. And, and you're just a tool of his. Look, in, in this church, I could drop dead tonight. And you know what? This church is going to go on tomorrow. And now you better weep and well and cry, okay? Or I'll come back and haunt you. Look, look, you know what? It's going to go on tomorrow. I'm not Mount Olive's Messiah. I'm not your Messiah. You know what I am? I'm a tool that God has chosen to use here. And if something ever happens to me, you know what he'll do? He'll pick up the next tool that he has in line to do what I'm doing. If we're not careful, we'll begin to see ourselves as, as way too essential. This causes me, when I do this, it'll cause me to devalue the importance of the gifts and ministries of others. Well, I, I, I've got to do it all. I've got to do it all. And boy, I'm bad about that. Because for years, man, the church I came from, a pretty large church, and... and uh, uh, went through a church split and all of a sudden I took on everybody else's jobs the people that left and, and I was doing it all and, and so now it's just kind of in me just to do it all it's not that I think I'm great okay it's just I don't like to pester people but by the way there's a lot of stuff we need help with around here okay and if you want to do it you're welcome to it <clears throat> instead of seeing myself as one of God's many tools I begin to see myself as the answer to the problem and it causes me to devalue the importance and gifts of, and ministries of others. Look, bus ministry. I love bus ministry. Okay? Look, any bus workers in here, let me tell you something. We are not the answer to it all. Okay? We are not the saviors of the world. We're just simply tools in God's hand. And by the way, if, if we don't yield to him, he's going to raise up somebody else. All right. Sunday school teachers. We have good, good Sunday school teachers. Let me tell you something. You're not the answer to the problem. Only Christ is. You're just one of his tools. Hey, deacons, you're not the answers to the problems. You're the problem. No, you're not. We have some great deacons here. You're not the answers to the... We're not the Messiah. Okay? <clears throat> now, here's the next thing. Oh, I already said this. Let's, oh, here's 1 Timothy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Here's what Paul said. Of whom I am chief. Paul, you're the chief of sinners? How many of you ever get to feeling like you're the chief of sinners? I, yeah, I get to feeling like you're the chief of sinners too. No, I get to feel like I am. Sometimes I think, Paul, I know you say you did this and this, but boy, I know my own heart. All right. And when we get to thinking, well, we are more essential than we are, we place a greater value on ourselves than what God really intended for us. Our, our treasure has shifted. Here's the next thing. Confidence. Now, I believe in being confident. Okay? We need to be confident. Sometimes our confidence is misplaced. This confidence here is a shifting away from a humble confidence in the transforming grace to overconfidence in one's own experience and gifts. Listen, I, I confessed my sin last Sunday morning, didn't I? Okay, that, that was big for me. I, I, I've said for a long time, I've said, look, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trusting Christ. And by the way, I am just trusting Christ. But all of a sudden I realized, or, or the Lord kind of showed me, look, I placed you there, man. 
And I've let all these things happen in your life to shape you and mold you to be able to do that. And I've given you certain ta talents and gifts. And by you denying all that, you're, you're showing you're not grateful. Well, I confess, I, I was not confident, not in myself, but in his transforming grace. If God has called you or led you to do something, folks, then by his grace, he will also enable you to do that. So our treasure ought to be in a humble confidence in his transforming grace, but sometimes it shifts to overconfidence in our own experience and gifts. Let's see here. Listen to Philippians 4.13. Paul, this great preacher, this great evangelist, this great missionary, here's what he said. I can do all things. Man, Paul, that sounds pretty cocky. He would say, well, let me finish. Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You see the difference there? He's very confident. But his confidence is not in his own abilities and his own gifts and talents and experiences. His confidence is in Christ. <clears throat> I don't lay a lot of stock to this self-confidence stuff. But I do lay a whole lot of stock to a Christ confidence. Christ in me. Sir, ma'am, you have children, you have this home. And if you're not careful, you'll fall into this trap of thinking, especially, Brother Brad, Sister Rachel, you have little children. Let me tell you something. They're easy to deal with now. I know you don't think so. You think, man, they drive me crazy. And Ethan is wide open. I love to watch that kid. <clears throat> If you're not careful, as they grow up and they're, they're doing well and they're well behaved and people come to you while you're eating and, and, uh, and say, hey, boy, you, I just want you to know you have a lovely family and your children are well behaved and, man, and they'll compliment your family. And if you're not careful, you'll fall in this thing of, I know what I'm doing. I, I, I've got this parenting thing mastered. Then they become teenagers. Okay. And which is still a great time of parenting, but you start to realize, you know what? They have a mind of their own. They have a will of their own. They're going to have to choose. I remember as uh, uh, we'd be out eating and I had all five of my boys and my wife, we'd be out eating somewhere and somebody would come and say, oh my, you have a wonderful family. Boy, you've really, I mean, they're so well behaved, so mannerly. And I said something to one of them, they said, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, up there. Oh my, you know, I won't be honest with you. Sometimes that puffed me up. That stroked my ego. And I think, well, you know, I do, I do have this parenting thing under, under control. You know, no, I don't. Listen, all I can have confidence in is the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. Right? You follow what I'm saying? <clears throat> now look here. We are all capable of of becoming way too confident in ourselves. The result of that kind of shift in our treasure, shifting our confidence from Christ to a confidence in ourselves, the result of that is when it's time to grieve, I don't grieve enough because I've got it under control. When it's time to pray, I don't pray enough. Because I've got it under control. Listen, let me tell you something, parents of little children. And, oh, Amy, you've got one. How old are you, Alana? Twelve. That is the age that Mark Twain said to put them in a box with a hole in it so you could give them food. And then I think he said at, what is it, 16 or 18? At 16, you plug the hole. Okay. But she won't really do that, Alana. <coughs> but you've got a 12-year-old, 12, 12, right? 12-year-old girl here. Need I say more? Look, don't ever, and she's a good girl, by the way, but don't ever have so much confidence in yourself that you neglect to pray for those two kids of yours. Oh, my goodness. Well, we need to be praying for our children. But when our confidence shifts from a confidence in the transforming grace of Christ, and we, we forget this thing of, I can do all things through Christ, and we start living out, I can, I can do all things. 
and we forget to, we don't pray enough. We don't prepare enough. We don't confess enough. We don't listen to others enough. Listen to what one person said about this. We begin to assign to ourselves capabilities we don't have. And because we do, we do not minister out of our own sense of need for Christ's grace. And we do not seek out the help of others. Listen, folks, I know we live in this world where we think, well, you, you've got to you've gotta put on this facade of, you know, we have it all together. And we can't let anybody know our weaknesses or our struggles. I want to tell you, that's a lie straight from the pit. As a body of Christ, we are a family. And within this family, <clears throat> let me tell you something, I know you're not perfect. You know I'm not perfect. So let's just stop trying to convince each other we're perfect. You know what? You struggle with things. I struggle with things. All God's children struggle with things. And sometimes when I'm struggling, you know what I need? I need somebody to talk to. Why don't you talk to Jesus? I do. But he gave us the body of Christ for a purpose. And sometimes I need to talk to a friend. That'll say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. Let me help keep you accountable. Let me call you every so often or shoot a text or let's stay in touch with each other. You know what, sometimes you have something you struggle with. You need to talk to somebody. Now, true, you do have to be careful who you talk to. Not everybody's mature enough to be what they need to be yet, but you find a, a godly, mature person you can talk to. Now listen, let me conclude this and get to the next part. Each of these shifts that we've talked about are from confidence in the treasure of the relentless grace of Christ, the Redeemer, to hope in earthbound treasures, which he reminds us in Matthew 6, are just temporary by nature and have no capacity to deliver what we are seeking. When we shift our treasure from heavenly things to earthly things, and I'm not just talking about material things, but I'm talking about our reputation, our confidence, what other people think of us, then now we have shifted our treasure to something that cannot give us what we're looking for. Could this kind of, let me ask you this question, could this kind of question, or could this kind of shift, be what leads to so many institutional problems with the church or to relational breakdowns? That we shift our treasure from heavenly things to earthly things, what we essentially do with these five shifts here, we shift our treasure from Christ to us and what people think about us and how we appear to others. I wonder if that's part of the problem with the church now. Well, you know, we've got to deal with this because of what people will think about our church. Well, now, wait a minute. Are we, are we concerned, really, at the root of it, are we concerned about our reputation or are we concerned about his reputation? Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, that person, do you see how that person came in? I mean, man, that's a rough customer right there. If we get many of those rough customers coming in, I mean, they're tatted up and pierced up, and my goodness, I, I mean, they're probably drug users and this, that. If we get many of them in here, people are going to think we're, we're, we've gone crazy. Really, really, are we worried about that? They might, those kind of people might come because they need something. I hope we're the kind, I hope we're the kind of church that someone, some old, motorcycle uh, gang rider that's been out of just got out of prison and he's he's all tatted up and and pierced up and he's he's got a swastika on his forehead it's like, preacher I don't want them here I do because they need Christ well preacher what if somebody comes to visit and they see that rascal let me tell you something the only difference between those people and that guy is you can see his problems or you can see the result of his problems. The others just have it hid real good. 
it leads to relational breakdowns. We get overconfident in our marriage. We don't seek help. We get overconfident in our child rearing and we don't seek help. We don't seek God. We don't pray. We don't go to others and talk to others. It's what the body of Christ. Folks, do you really think Christ established the church just so we can come here three days a week and sit down and look at each other? No. They tell us, Freddie over here, Freddie's a good guy. Wish I could say that about his wife. But she's not a guy. She's a good lady. Okay. So I don't wish I could say it about his wife. You know what? We need them. We need you. And they need us. Old Ricky over here. Bless his heart. Has to sit next to Joanne. Go home with Joanne. <laughs> Let me tell you something. That's right. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Ricky. We need Ricky. There's going to be some time. You know, I, I don't know Ricky well enough yet to know his gifts. But I know he has some. Okay? The Holy Spirit distributes those as he will. I know he has some. I don't know exactly what they are yet, but somebody in here is going to need Ricky sometime. By the way, Ricky's going to need us sometime. Pull Joanne off of him when she's mad. <laughs> could this kind of shift that we've been talking about be part of what leads a life of service to come a, become a burden rather than a joy sometimes we take on all these positions of service and we do what we do either because it, it's, we just enjoy it or, or to please someone else, or it's a position of power and we're just power-seeking that kind of personality, that type A person, I want to be a leader. <clears throat> but we're doing it for the wrong reasons. We're hoping that place of service will give us something that we need, and it can't. And when it can't, all of a sudden it becomes a burden it becomes laborious. Whereas if we're doing it just because our treasure is Christ, and I don't have to do anything to please anybody, but because of his overwhelming, relentless, radical grace that pursues me, because of his love, man, I want to serve him. Man, now it's fun. I like to fish. Anybody here like to fish? If I had to fish for a living, now some of you might would really like that, but if I, let's say, commercial fishing, I don't think I'd love that. Because it's something I every day have to get out, get up early, stay out late, go out catch them fish, clean them fish every day. But when I go fishing just because I want to go fishing, I don't have to. It's fun. How many of you like cleaning dishes? What? No, no hands raised? Just Raylan. She's the only godly lady in here. Do young men see that that are her age? She likes to wash dishes. She's a keeper. No, I don't like to wash dishes. But I love my wife. And because I love my wife, if I see some dirty dishes, I say, Lance, wash the dishes. No, wash the dishes. And you know what? When I'm washing the dishes, <laughs> washing the dishes, <laughs> you know what that consists of? Putting them in a machine. <laughs> and even that is a drag, isn't it? You know why I do that? Just because she's been good to me. And all of a sudden, it's not labor. It's not a chore. It's a reward. Why? Because at that moment... The the treasure is not me. The treasure is her. Now, I'm operating out of that, that mindset. The treasure of the kingdom of self. Remember we said that battle was between the kingdom of self and the kingdom of God? 
the treasure of the kingdom of self becomes all the more seductive and powerful when we lose sight of the glories of what we've been given in Christ. Listen, church, we have been given everything we need in Jesus Christ. You know where our joy should come from? From Jesus Christ. You, you know where our, our peace should come from? From Jesus, Jesus Christ. Look, he gives a peace that passes understanding. Who else can give you that? He gives a joy unspeakable. He, he said that he, he desires for our joy to be full. Who else can give you that kind of joy? Who, who else can give you hope like the kind of hope Jesus Christ offers? Nobody can give that kind of hope. Nobody. And when I let the, the kingdom of self Cause me to lose sight of the glories of, of what we've been given in Jesus Christ. Listen, that will lead me to think of myself as poor when grace has made me rich. We'll take our eyes off of all that God has given us. We'll set our eyes on the things of this world and what people think of us and our reputation and, and people's material things and this person's house and that person's car. We'll set our eyes on all these things and we will tell ourselves, woe is me, we are poor. No, we're not. We've been made joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And if we're not careful at that point, we'll begin to seek riches in places where they cannot be found. You see, wealthy people of this world that have, I mean, they have fame, they have reputation, they have finances, they have power. And, and then you see on the news that they become tangled up in some vice, whether it's drugs or alcohol or sex or or whatever and they're they're living this life of debauchery and you, you think why would they do that man they have they have it all they're still looking for something they're looking for love in all the wrong place they're they're looking in places where it's not going to be found. Listen, when we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, we make Christ our treasure, right? and we realize that His grace provides for us all that we need, we then realize, I don't have to look, look anywhere else. I've already been given all I need. And listen, even though we were, are laboring for him, we can find our rest in him. Isn't that a good thing, folks? Listen, I'm going to stop there and, and go to the next part next week. Lord, have mercy on us. We are just weak flesh.